Hot off the press. So I was scratching my head to think what is hot off the press in aortic valve and then I uh, sat at dinner the other night uh, with one of the authors of the important papers uh, of uh, TAVI thrombosis. And so it made me think that this is something that we should talk about today. Uh, this is a fantastic new technology and it's taken the world by storm. 200,000 TAVIs have been done now. And we think that uh, it's a xenograft. And so you don't think about clot when you think about xenografts. But uh, as we saw from um, James just before, thrombosis of xenografts is a thing. And uh, the sort of complete immunity that you think you've got, maybe just take some aspirin or dual antiplatelets for a while and everything's going to be okay. Maybe we don't have quite that immunity that we thought we had. And the first case reports of, uh, of uh, TAVI thrombosis were coming out in about 2013, 2014. And in fact, the titles of some of these uh, uh, case reports was, is it real? Because nobody could believe their eyes. So let's have a talk about this case. This is one from Prince Charles we had. Uh, this is uh, pre-operative, uh, uh, a person going, uh, undergoing a TAVI uh, with, as expected, severe aortic stenosis. It looks like maybe reduced ventricular function there, but... Uh, because the Vmax is only 3.6, valve area is 0.78, so uh, appropriate. Next morning, uh, this is the echo. Vmax 2.2 metres per second, appropriate. Uh, High-ish, but okay. But have a look at this thing, we call this humming. We see this a lot, actually, this high, high frequency uh, uh, velocities that we see uh, in the systolic envelope. And we think that that's related to uh, these very uh, supple leaflets vibrating. Anyway, this person came back uh, for reasons, uh, I'm not quite sure, about a month later, and uh, the gradient, the, the Vmax has gone from 2.2 to 2.9, the gradient has gone from 20 to 34. Doesn't sound like a lot, except that gradients are supposed to go down after, you, after your initial sort of post-operative recovery period. Remember that theoretically, the people are pretty revved up the next day and their adrenaline levels are high and so on. So usually uh, with these sort of uh, prosthesis going, you see higher gradient on the first day and, falls back to sort of what it should be with time. So this uh, is a case of, uh, of uh, uh, TAVI thrombosis and let's have a look at it. And these are the two key papers uh, about TAVI thrombosis. The first one was in the New England Journal and Raj Makar, who was here <coughs> in, in Sydney last year, spoke at um, uh, one of our conferences. Uh, a couple of important ECHO people here, and, these, and Samir Kapadia, who I train with in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, put this together. This was uh, from the Portico IDE trial, which is a, was the pre-approval pre trial, and they were doing CT scans on all of these folks, um, and it was a randomised trial, and uh, they found unbelievably that 40% of people had reduced leaflet motion. Nobody could believe their eyes. And... Uh, then everybody worried that maybe it was something wrong with this valve or there was some fundamental problem, but that's not true at all. Uh, because when the larger paper by uh, Chakavati was done, and this is uh, in The Lancet in 2017, uh, with this important group of people, and it was Martina that I was at dinner with the other night who gave me these slides, uh, indeed it is prevalent across all these prostheses. So in this very large uh, review of 931 people uh, who had either... Uh, tabbies or surgical valves um, and 752 tabbies and 138 surgical valves with these sorts of pictures that you just saw before from James uh, uh, with uh, this uh, thrombus and so on and I'll t t describe that in more detail um, they found an, an incredibly high uh, incidence of these two findings one was HALT you're going to learn two new words today HALT hypoattenuated which means kind of dark leaflet thickening. This is the first CT finding that you get when you're starting to get thrombus formation uh, on a leaflet. Halt. The second thing is RELM. And RELM, unbelievably, stands for reduced leaflet motion. Who'd have thought it? <laughs> you CT guys, what you come up with, I don't know. Anyway, RELM, reduced leaflet motion. And that is the uh, the, the, move, the lack of movement. See, a normal aortic leaflet should go all the way back to the frame. So uh, this one goes, the, right, the, the left coronary cusp goes all the way back to the frame. The right coronary cusp here is going all the way back to the frame. But the non-coronary cusp is held out from the frame by W width. And W divided by the radius is the realm. So 
for example, this one looks like it's about 60% realm, for example. And here, here we are, here, here's how it's graded. And so realm is this, uh, is this lack of motion of the leaflet and, and halt is the thickening, is the discussion of the thickening. Anyway, in this uh, large trial by Chakravarti, 13% uh, uh, of TAVIs, 13% had, had, had these findings, unbelievable. And of the surgical valves, uh, just on 4%. So this is more than anybody could have imagined. And what does it mean? Does it mean anything? Well, it means a bit. One is that if you've got realm, uh, then you're likely with time, and remember, it doesn't usually happen the next morning, it usually happens uh, over weeks or months that follow, um, then you've got increased gradients. And that's understandable because you've got re re reduced leaflet motion. And indeed, um, if you had, uh, sorry, the, the prevalence was um, uh, um, higher if you started with a high gradient and if you, and if you saw um, a step up in gradient. So people with realm had high gradients to start with and they had a more than 10 point rise, as that case of ours, uh, rise in their pressure. So why might you get it? Well, it doesn't seem to be related to the person so much, maybe slightly related to the size of the prosthesis, maybe slightly related to valve and valve, I'll talk about that in a minute, but it, it certainly is pertinent whether or not you're on warfarin or, or another anticoagulant. Now, you wouldn't normally think that you'd be putting a xeno uh, on warfarin, usually, in fact, most of these folks go home on dual antiplatelets, but other people were, well, some people were on warfarin for AF and other reasons, and uh, they were much uh, less likely uh, to get it. What about valve type? Well, across this very large review of 600 or so uh, devices, um, it is actually been that these uh, thr leaflet thrombos have been seen across all the devices, uh, although it seemed to be more common in the balloon expandable devices, and it seemed to be more common if you did valve and valve, I guess that's pre predictable, and uh, it was obviously more common if you weren't on warfarin, just on dual antiplatelet. So what about the mechanisms? Why might this happen to some people and not others? Well, it could be related to how well you've deployed the valve. And so by looking at um, constraint, which is whether or not a 23 millimeter valve really is 23 millimeters, and whether or not there is a fractional uh, constraint, and that is to say, are the three leaflets symmetrical or is one or other of them not fully, fully expanded? So one might be only uh, less angle than the other two, and therefore, if it's un not fully unfolded, more likely to have stasis. And so using these various CT and other phenomena, there have been uh, predictors uh, made for uh, whether or not there is some structural reason why you might get thr uh, thrombosis and uh, leaflet reduced motion realm. But Samir uh, came up with this thought, and uh, this is his hand-drawn slides, but it's about to be in publication. And I think he might be onto it here. So Dr. Kapadi had uh, made the point that you, this is the anatomical sinus of Valsalva. Uh, here is the, the, the leaflets. And here's a new sinus of Valsalva that you've made, sort of a sinus within a sinus. And anywhere where you've got blind pouches, you're more vulnerable uh, to thrombus formation. And as Stuart probably sees in his MRIs, uh, I think flow dynamics within the neosinus, particularly when they're quite deep, uh, like in a low seated valve like this, there is um, issues with stasis and lack of spillover into the real sinus of Falsava, which might make them more vulnerable. And I think this is, this is uh, territory for more um, study. So what about, um, what do we do about it and how might we prevent it? Well, as you can imagine, uh, if you're on warfarin, or to a lesser extent, novel anticoagulants, but mostly uh, warfarin, um, you very seldom see this. And I do recall that uh, surgical AVR, some of our surgeons actually put our, the folks onto warfarin for six weeks, some of them even longer, uh, in the post-operative period. I never really understood what the logic was, but I think this finding that if you go home uh, on your antiplatelets and warfarin, that you've got virtually none of this issue. And indeed, if you look at this, this picture here, uh, mono antiplatelet, dual antiplatelets, and but if you uh, there's a, this this incidence here of reduced leaflet motion realm. But if you're on warfarin or a NOAC plus your dual antiplatelets, any kind of anticoagulants, that's that this this blue one is the sum of these two. There's much less risk of this event occurring. Now the good news is that if you give warfarin 
uh, you can make the problem uh, uh, go away, I presume, if you get it early enough. I would imagine that if it's there for a long time and it fibrosis hard into place, then uh, that, that there may not be so much reversibility. But look at this uh, reduced leaflet motion here uh, becoming fully normalised and uh, in general nearly 100% in, in all the studies I looked at, 100% or nearly 100% uh, regression of the problem if you gave anticoagulants. And the time to, to resolution was just about a month or so. Presumably that's because when they were looking. Then you might say, well, why don't you just give warfarin to everybody? But what you're really saying is, why don't you give triple anticoagulants, that is dual antiplatelet and warfarin, to everybody? And then the partner trials, serious bleeding issues uh, were not insubstantial and the bleeding issues kill you. So that if you give elderly people all triple anticoagulants, triple bud thinning, uh, aspirin, Plavix and Warfarin, you, you, it's going to come at a price. And so somehow or other we're going to have to determine who's who and which people get the protection. Now there's a bunch of studies ongoing, this is a list of them at the present time, um, and uh, the original one was the RT trial, A-R-T-E, which was basically an antiplatelet trial, uh, and it, it, it showed uh, presume, uh, predictably that dual antiplatelets were better. But this was kind of before this understanding about uh, realm and halt. So what we're waiting for now is the Galileo trial, which I think is uh, nearly finished recruiting, but I don't think we've got the data back yet uh, because it's a, a two-year follow-up. But basically it's a trial of dual antiplatelets uh, plus rivaroxaban, uh, and the Atlantis trial ju dual antiplatelets and apixaban. I, I don't see a trial that I could find anyway that was testing warfarin, but the concept is out there that adding an anticoagulant in the immediate uh, treatment and uh, uh, may be the strategy here. So what's it all mean? Well, there are going to be pa uh, patient factors. For example, the people who have this thrombosis have, seem to have higher D-dimers. Interestingly, they've got lower platelet counts, but they have higher D-dimers. There's going to be device issues here, and the design of the devices might need a slight change. Procedural issues, I think particularly the low-sitting the low sitting devices, are going to be a problem. Uh, probably renal function is probably an issue. We're going to have to learn about which uh, versions of blood thinners we're going to give, and for the fibrillation people, uh, we think about other options. So is all gloomy? Well, this is the, this is the editorial from that New England Journal paper, um, and uh, <coughs> if you read that, it says that the, we, the FDA, believe that the available evidence supports the conclusion these valves remain safe. And so whilst this is a new finding, and whilst it's more common than we thought, most of it is subclinical, uh, and I think that we await care, uh, eagerly now to see what the results of these uh, triple anticoagulant trials are. Thanks very much.